How's the royal family? I pray that everyone is doing well. Well, my royal family, I'm going to speak on our queen here like many have spoke on about her tragic death again in the streets of America. And we are under great siege. And so I, I sat on it for a few days because I have an article that I'm going to read to the royal family and I have two videos that I'm going to present. And um, the word to keep on your frontal lobe is gentrification. Now, before I read the article, when I um, first heard the story, I didn't. I didn't put two and two together right away, but some of the things that I was hearing um, in this outright slaughtering sound very familiar to me. Now, if anybody's um, new to the True Royal family or True Royal, I had been doing a series of videos where um, down in Chicago, there had been quite a few um, police raiding homes and the common denominator was every time they would raid these homes there would be children or royal babies and they were very vicious they were very nasty and very unforgiving about how they got down they went as far as one of our royal sons I think it was his sixth birthday they even slammed the cake on the floor dug holes in the walls and in the ceilings and pulled guns on these children. And the thing that was the same was they would, whoever they were looking for, it would always turn out that that person had been in jail for a long, long time. Um, some of them didn't even live there. They would visit. They may have been related to somebody or something like that. In some cases, they did live at these houses. And I was thinking to myself, the type of technology that we have, how can you continue to keep messing this up? And so the former chief of police that was fired in uh, Chicago, he didn't give a damn one way or the other. And I was glad when they got rid of his ass because um, I knew karma was on him because he just would not step up to the plate, you know, and there's these children that look like his children, but we're not surprised with these gatekeepers they are being dealt with everyone is being dealt with when you do anything negative to the royal family so now we have our beautiful queen here Brianna Taylor and her um, very warious warrior brave boyfriend did the best that he could to protect her and we will hear his voice today but before we get into the two videos, I have an article to read to the royal family. Lawyers say Miss Taylor's house raid was part of gentrification plan. On Sunday, July 5th, Brianna Taylor's family filed a new lawsuit in, oops, what happened? Lost my article that quick, oops. Let's see what happened, oh, there it is. Excuse me for that, let me start back over. On Sunday, July 5th, Brianna Taylor's family filed a new lawsuit in Jefferson's um, circuit court that alleged the search warrant that led to her death was part of a plan to clear out a block of residents and make way for a multi-million dollar redevelopment. To speed up the area's gentrification, the place-based investigations, police squad deliberately misled narcotics detective to search a home on Taylor Street under the impression that the area housed extremely dangerous criminals and drug rings, lawyers now claim. The execution of the search warrant robbed Brianna of her life and Tamika Palmer of her daughters, of her daughters. Attorney 
Benjamin Kirk told a courier of the new lawsuit. It execute and exhibits an outrageous recklessness and willful, warrant unprecedented and unlawful conduct. The new suit further states that the drug invest investigation was designed to target primary roadblock to the new development, Jamarcus Glover, Taylor's um, ex-boyfriend. In the affidavit used to obtain the no-knock search warrant for um, Taylor's house, Detective Joshua Jays claimed that he had seen Glover, again, as her ex, leave Taylor's home in January with a U. P.S. package before taking the package to a known drug house. He also wrote that the U.S. Postal Inspector had confirmed to him that Glover had been receiving suspicious packages at Taylor's house. However, after Taylor's death, a Louisville Postal Inspector told um, WDRB News that um, Jay's never asked an inspector to verify whether or not Glover was receiving packages at Taylor's house. Furthermore, um, postal inspectors have already looked into the claim at the request of a different agency and determined that he wasn't. And you know what? Um, Lisa did a great coverage of that a few weeks ago, um, how they tried to get the um, postal company all wrapped up in that too. So they put their ass on blast. Okay, Jays is, this cop is uh, currently on administrative reassignment, so he's still getting paid. Following an investigation into how he obtained the search warrant using the alleged false information, the new lawsuit brought forth by Taylor's family's lawyers connects the search warrant to a redevelopment plan. Brianna's home should never have had the police there in the first place. When the layers are peeled back, the the origin of Brianna's home being raided by the police start with a um, politician need to clear out a street for a large real estate redevelopment project and finish with a newly formed road police unit violating all levels of policy, protocol, and policing standards, the lawsuit reads. Brianna's death was the accumulation of this um, ridiculous politician and police conduct. The reality was that the occupants were nowhere close to Louisville's versions of Pablo Escobar or Scarface. The complaint continues, and they were not violent criminals. They were sim simply a setback to a large real estate development deal. Thus, the issue need to be cleared up. Normally, when they want you out of a neighborhood, they pay you. So, uh, let's see. According to the carrier spokesman of um, the Louisville uh, mayor, Greg Fleischer, has called the allegations outrageous and without foundation or supporting facts. They are insulting to the neighborhood members of the Vision Russell Initiative and all the people involved in the years of work being done to revitalize the neighborhood of West Louisville, Deputy Director of Communication for the Mayor's Office, Gene Porter, said in a statement, the mayor is absolutely committed to the work and the evidence by the city's work to support a one billion in capital projects that over the past few years included a new YMCA the city's foundational $10 million grant to the Louisville Urban League Sports and Learning Complex, the Cedar Street Housing Development and New Businesses, um, down payment, home ownership assistance, and of course, the remaking of a large Beecher Terrace initiative. So far, one officer involved in Taylor's death has been fired from the police department. Okay. One thing that I want y'all to keep on y'all front of low, my royal family, is that um, what I've been noticing in a lot of argue, uh, a lot of articles lately, if we complaining about anything, 
now what I've been seeing quite a bit of is how different corporations and organizations are donating donating all this money to the unquote black cause and they want us to fall over and be utterly grateful donating some money that will not impact us at all because at the end of the day they control the narrative so let's get into this first video City Council now plans to investigate how the mayor responded to the deadly police shooting of Breonna Taylor. Taylor was killed back in March in what her family calls a botched police raid. It added fuel to the worldwide protest against police brutality in this country. And one of the three officers involved has since been fired, but no criminal charges have been filed against him. That officer is appealing his firing, saying it was unjustified. Last week, we spoke with Breonna Taylor's mother, Tamika Palmer, was now filed a wrongful death lawsuit. She was in tears talking about the support that she's received. What would be most helpful to you at this time? To continue to say her name, to, um, like I said, we're still just in the beginning. There's still so much work to be done. So just please continue to say her name. Please continue to march and, and demand justice. Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher joins us now to discuss the Breonna Taylor case. He says that he will work to implement police reform in his new role as president of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. This is an interview that you'll see only on CBS This Morning. And Mayor Fisher, we thank you for joining us today. You've got a lot going on, a lot to discuss. Let's start with the Breonna Taylor case. So one officer has been fired. Two others have not been fired. Are you satisfied where things stand in that case right now? Well, good morning, Gail. Thanks for having me. The guiding principle throughout Breonna Taylor's tragedy has been get to the truth, get to the truth. I've asked the Attorney General, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney to be involved to make sure that no matter what the outcome, the truth comes out. So where the case is right now is with the Attorney General, uh, Daniel Cameron. He will be deciding if any criminal charges will be filed on this case. In the meantime, we're not waiting for improvements. Uh, I signed Breonna's law into law a couple of weeks ago. That bans the use of no-knock warrants here in Louisville. It also requires body cameras be used on all search warrants. So we're not waiting anytime we have an improvement opportunity. We swing into that. Uh, that's what the U.S. Conference of Mayors will be do doing also as we look at broader police reform around the country. Mm -hmm. You're right. We all want the truth. You're absolutely right about that. And one officer has been fired. And I think Breonna Taylor's mother and people who are very uh, upset about her death want the other two officers to be fired. What do you think? I know we're all looking into the thing, right. but you are the mayor of the city. Your opinion matters. Well, the, what's important is the truth, and that's why all these different agencies are looking at this. Um, I'm actually preclu precluded by state law, believe it or not, which I would really like to see changed, KRS 67C, from commenting further on this case while it's investigation, but that's why you want the FBI, and you want the Attorney General, and you want the U.S. Attorney, and now it's with the Attorney General here in the state of K Kentucky to determine what the next steps are going to be. What was your personal reaction when you first heard about the circumstances of Breonna Taylor's death? What did you think about the actions of your police department? Well, I'm, you're distraught. I mean, I have kids uh, that are about the age, not kids, but young adults uh, about the same age as Breonna Taylor, and, and you put yourself in the position of Breonna's mom and just say, you know, how would you react to something like that? And it's just a pit in your stomach. And it, it's just say, how do you move through these tragedies then as a city to improve, try to make sure something like this never happens again? It's the nature of a mayor's job that you occasionally have tragedy and then you have to move forward and try to bring your community with you at the same time. So it's certainly something that we're extraordinarily sorry about. Yeah, a lot of people feel that way, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. We're, a lot of people also wonder why it took 110 days for the city to take any action. And it was only after there were national protests following the death of George Floyd. Can you talk about why it yeah, took so long before there was any action in the case? Absolutely. I mean, Louisville has been a leader in the release of body camera evidence after, when there's an officer involved shooting, and that's one of the real problems or challenges with this case is there is no body camera footage. These were undercover narcotics officers executing a search warrant. 
Uh, since then, I've changed that policy. So unlike some of the other cases that we see around the country, there's no direct evidence of what's happened. So that's when a public integrity unit investigation takes place. Those typically last two to six months. Uh, probably about, what, 60, 70 days into this case is when action started being taken in terms of what the facts were that we knew that were coming out in terms of improvement in the community. But the fundamental lack of body cameras has been the big stumbling block in this case. Yeah, you know, we, we mentioned congratulations on your new position because you're now head of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. What do you all think is the number one thing that can be done to reduce these deadly encounters with the police department, especially as it pertains to the black community? Yeah, I mean, this is a time of real potential transformation for our country, I hope. When you've got a, a pandemic, we've got an economic recession, and we've got marches for racial justice taking place. Uh, there is no question that the climate is ripe for serious change in all types of societal issues, and police reform is absolutely one of those. The, the police have got to decide to be part of that. I know good cops definitely want to as well. Uh, sanctity of life has always got to be the number one issue. De-escalation has got to be a guiding principle uh, for all of these as well. And then the community has to see itself as part of cooperating to build safety in a community with trust in the police department. So there's no question that there's a lot of challenges that need to, uh, that need to be addressed. Uh, mayors are uniquely situated mm -hmm. in, the, in the country to be able to take a lot of these issues on. And I can tell you mayors exactly. are leaning into that right now. Police reform and racial justice is one of our top uh, priorities as we head into this new year. Well, Mayor, it seems like a tough time for you. I'm thinking if, you're, if you feel like you're wearing gasoline underpants because you've got the police <laughs> department on one hand demanding your resignation. They say they feel underappreciated, unsupported. Then you have the police reform protesters who are saying you're not doing enough. Both sides are calling for your resignation. How are you navigating this process for yourself, standing in the upright position? Well, I mean, that's kind of the, the nature of being a mayor in America today. And unfortunately, <laughs> this is happening all over America right now. That's, that's why the conditions are ripe for transformation. So we have not been in a place like this in America now for about 50 years or so. So the question is, will we get it right this time? I think the conditions are right, and I'm hopeful that it will. When you look at addressing some of the underlying challenges that America has right now in terms of the wealth and income gap that we have, now is the time where we need to change the minimum wage to a living wage. Now is the time when we need to mm -hmm. develop and prepare reparations proposals for African Americans to address this wealth gap in our country. So. Now is the time, too, to re recover from the COVID Act so we get direct federal funding so city budgets yeah. can stay healthy to provide basic services. So the nature of a mayor's job is uh, handling difficulty, turning that into hope and action so your citizens uh, can be in a better place, and that's what the mayors of America are going to do. Well, Mayor Fisher, you got a lot to do, and as you said, everybody wants to get it right, but also people believe now is the time for change. Thank you, sir, for your time this Absolutely. morning. Absolutely. So for joining us, Nora is off. I'm Margaret Brennan. The mayor spoke about absolutely nothing. He didn't answer her questions. Basically, if we didn't have the protesters that were doing their part, they was going to brush it under the rug. And this is one of these stories that all of us need to keep a spotlight on because what I am seeing just because mentoring that word gentrification that open up something you seeing how these things are happening as we have came out of our captivity the enemy continues to get exposed for their fuckery basically so now as we continue on because we don't get to hear this brother's voice um right and they try to Put him in the worst light. This is Miss Taylor's um, boyfriend, and we're gonna hear uh, what Mr. Walker have to say, along with the lies. And this uh, video um, is very new, very brand new. So let's get into it. A lot of news happening today. Governor Andy Bashir is mandating every Kentuckian to wear a mask. But first, we're hearing more interviews from police regarding the fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor in her Louisville apartment. WDRB Scott Reynolds joins us with more on the Public Integrity Unit interviews with the officer who shot and Breonna Taylor's boyfriend. 
It was around 12.30 in the morning, March 13th, when Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly and other police served that no-knock warrant at Taylor's apartment. Mattingly said even though the warrant was no-knock, they were given verbal instructions to knock, that it was considered a soft target, that they believed Brianna was home alone. Mattingly said after five or six different knocking episodes over 45 to 60 seconds and yelling police <coughs> search warrant repeatedly, there was no answer. Then the order to ram down the door. Mattingly says it took three tries and once it opened, he went in and ended up facing Taylor and her boyfriend Kenneth Walker about 20 feet away down a hallway. And there's a the male and a female. The male's closest to the door, so he's to my right. And as I turned the, the doorway, he's in a stretched out position with his hands with a gun. And as soon as I clear, he fires. Boom. And uh, it was almost like at the shooting range where two, two things flip at the same time and you got to shoot, no shoot. But, I mean, they were like shoulder to shoulder. My mind's going, this ain't right. You know, something's off here. Because all the doors I've, I've made entry and I've never seen this. As soon as the shot hit, I could feel the heat in my leg. And so I just returned fire. I got four rounds off. Um, and it was like simultaneous, it's boom, 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 boom. And then I went back and went down on the side of the door and then reached around, and I think I got two more off around the corner of the door. And then I could really feel the blood in my leg, so I reached out and felt it, and my hand was full of blood, and I knew it, it hit my femoral at that point. Mattingly says he was the only officer who fired at that time because the other officers were behind him and would have hit him. He managed to slide out of the apartment and says he later heard more gunfire. Now, for Kenneth Walker's account of what happened, he says Brianna had dozed off after watching TV with him, and there's a loud bang at the door. Walker says Brianna woke up and said, who is it, with no response. Walker says they started putting clothes on, and Brianna shouted at the top of her lungs, who is it? Still no response, he says. So Walker says he grabbed his gun that he was licensed to carry. He says it was unloaded, but he put one in the chamber when he heard that banging at the door. Let me get out of the uh, bed or whatever, like walking towards the door. The like the door like comes like off the hinges. So I just let off one shot. Like I still can't see who it is or anything. So now the door's like flying open, I let off one shot and then all of a sudden there's a whole lot of shots. And like we both just dropped to the ground and the gun like fell like right over there and I like kicked it because I'm like scared to death like now we're seeing lights and stuff so it's looking like okay it's the police and there's a lot of yelling and stuff. Walker said he fired just that one shot that he considered a warning. I don't know who's coming through this door the door just got kicked off the hinges so I'm scared he told officers. One shot boom and then there were a lot of shots. Walker said he called 911 and Brianna's mom, still not knowing it was police who had entered the apartment. More of these police interviews coming up tonight on our evening news. There are about two hours of interviews with Kenneth Walker and Sergeant Mattingly. You can hear it all on our website, WDRB.com. Scott Reynolds, WDRB News. All right, my royal family. A lot of news happening today. Governor Andy Beshear is mandating every Kentuckian to wear a mask. But first, we're hearing more interviews. Excuse me for that, my royal family. So I will be making a point going back to that um, station so we could hear more of the continuous lies. Um, when uh, Mr. Walker spoke, he um, waived his Miranda rights and just spoke at that particular time and we know that they had charged him with murder and eventually they did drop the charges um, and we see they have taken it out of the DA's hand and um, Taryn Rain a few other people but I know for sure Taryn Rain did cover the DA and we know what he's all about because um, we pretty much run the same circles and it's just all tragic and I want to speak just a little bit on gentrification gentrification is not going to work and the reason why it's not going to work is because, um, uh, how can I put it? Let me use San Francisco for an example. Since I live here in the Bay Area, grew up in San Francisco, they have ran a lot of families out of San Francisco. And you have your dot-comers and then you have the gay community. And um, they're not producing. And in order for a community to really thrive, you have to produce. 
So they have closed down a number of schools and they follow where the families go and that's where the federal dollars go. San Francisco is not a family oriented type of town anymore. And even though when we hear that word gentrification, some people brace and they do make an attempt, but um, I've known a number of unquote gentrified communities that um, they, they didn't have children. And I've been saying this for the longest. Um, eventually, I guess they will report it. Maybe I should look into it a little bit deeper, but gentrification is not gonna work if, unquote, the enemy is not producing. You have to have children in order for a community to thrive. Now we have coronavirus and these plagues is knocking folks down left and right. So back to our queen and her king, who we know is in a state of grieving. It all makes sense to me now when I was reporting, I think I reported about four or five stories um, about them in Chicago banging down doors, pulling guns on babies and everything. And I never thought that it has something to do with gentrification. Um, but now it makes a lot of sense when I started tying it in all together where, you know, people would feel some kind of way and be so nervous after having guns pulled on their royal babies and want to get up out of those communities and everything. You know, like I said before, there was a space and time when they wanted a community, they just pay you off to get up out of there. Now they're saying the hell with that. We're going to pocket that used cops to terrorize black folks as usual. And if we got to kill a few, oh, well, they have spilled our blood, our royal blood before, and they don't mind spilling it again. Well, now there is a day of reckoning for the enemy and the enemy supporters. Spilling our blood is going to be quite painful to any of y'all to do it. Even thinking, think about what I'm saying. The ones y'all come over here and sneak and listen. Even thinking about doing anything to us in a nefarious fashion will greatly cost you. I have spoke this in the universe and it will continue to come true. So my heart goes out again to Mr. Walker and um, Ms. Taylor's family. What a shame. So my royal family, render your voice with your beautiful divine words. And as always, my royal family, I thank you for your love. I thank you for your support. And with that said, I'll share.